Hi, uh, my name is Dr. Raja Adnan Ahmed and I am a consultant psychiatrist currently working in UK. And I'm doing a series of interviews where I'm uh, inviting some successful IMGs who have secured uh, training in various specialties uh, to share their experiences. And I'm pleased to have Dr. Manzoor with me. Uh, he, he came to UK in 2018 uh, and started his uh, core medical training. After passing MRCP, he has now secured uh, training in cardiology. A lot of IMGs uh, who are training in medicine, they aspire to become cardiologists, but the message they get that uh, maybe cardiology is not, not for IMGs or, or it's too hard for IMGs to get in. So I thought it would be really important for us to get an uh, inspiring figure from an IMG community or somebody who has recently uh, uh, secured a cardiology training. So Dr. Mazu, thank you very much for uh, joining us. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Dr. Adnan. Uh, uh, I really appreciate you for, for everything that you're doing. For, for people like me, like who, who have come recently, like I came in 2018, as you said, and thanks for the introduction as well. Uh, people like you are inspired, like inspiring figures for us. And we look towards you and we are back home. And then, and then, and, and, and then when we do things, we feel like, like whatever you say is, is like absolutely right. And, and it's, it's like, if, if, if we are here, we are here to help others as well. And that should be the intention of, of, of IMGs who have, have secured our training post. So yeah, I'll, be, I'll try to be as much helpful as I, as I could, yeah. Thank, thank you for your kind words. So uh, can you share something about your journey of how you uh, ended up coming to UK and you know, how, how, you, uh, how you started thinking about cardiology and how, what did you do to get into that training? Yeah, so I, uh, my, my journey started in 2000 and um, I, I finished my graduation uh, not very, uh, very recently, like in 2016. I have graduated from uh, Srinagar in Jammu and Kashmir in India. So uh, that, that place wasn't quite big on like people going outside. So it was quite a journey for me to, to come from there to here. And uh, I started as, as an F2 in, in a small host district hospital first couple of months and then did my core medical training. I'm, I'm about to finish my CT2 year now. And I, Alhamdulillah, got a cardiology ST3 number, uh, which I'm starting re, uh, in August. Uh, so uh, after after having, because when I came here, I didn't know uh, whether I wanted to do cardio or gastro. I would just focus on internal medicine. Uh, that was one thing I was sure about. And after doing the core medical training, uh, and after having worked in different specialties, there were a couple of specialties in my mind that I wanted to do because people who usually apply for gastro and cardio and respiratory, these are three branches that usually people apply together. So I, I was interested in something where there's on hands experience. So, so this was, this was on the top of the list, but yeah, as you said, the core medical training in itself is, is quite vast and there are so many things we have to do to get a, to get, get a favorable outcome. So uh, while doing core medical training, this interest started to develop and yeah. Uh, so that's how I applied in cardiology. And luckily this year, I was lucky because all the interviews were canceled except for uh, except for very few when I appeared in one of uh, the uh, interviews in cardiology and then that's how I ended up with the job. So uh, can you share uh, some of the experience around uh, how did you apply for cardiology you know what is the process of that and uh, also we would like to know about your interview experience itself as well. Mm -hmm. so, so the process in cardiology is quite different from other specialties actually because it's a, it's a cascadable ap application. It, it, it isn't a national application. So you have to apply to clusters. So how they divide the country is in, in six regions. And before applying, you have to decide that which region you are applying to. For example, I applied to Wessex Deanery. So you have to make, make sure that you know what, which region you want to work in for next five, six, seven years. Uh, so that's the first, first thing. And then the applications are regional as well. So you, you can rank your regions, like you have to rank four regions and then you get called for interview from one of those regions, your, your top most uh, region. And, and that's where the short listing score uh, plays a very important role. For example, if somebody wants to be in South Yorkshire, for instance, uh, the short listing score, if he, if he doesn't get interviewed in short listing score, he will be called in, for example, Wales. And then if he, if he gets a job there, uh, he can't, he can't come to South Yorkshire. So it's, it's very different from how other specialties work. So that's first and foremost, you have to choose your uh, deanery wisely. And the second thing is, is the shortlisting score itself. The reason, why, uh, the reason why cardiology is thought to be a very competitive speciality because getting an interview in, a, in your uh, favorable uh, deanery is, is, is difficult actually. I've seen my like, uh, local British co colleagues who didn't get in interviews in cardiology in places where they wanted to go to. So that's where the shortlisting scores play a big role. 
Uh, however, in the in the in the whole process, in how you know once the final seats are allocated, it doesn't play as much as as a role. But in the you know shortlisting of interviews, it has a big role to play. So uh, quickly, uh, I don't think we IMG should think that something is out of out of bound for us. We can. I've seen like all my colleagues who are CT twos. We have, I've seen all my friends like getting into all the specialities that. People used to tell me like two years before it, it's impossible to get into specialties like cardiology, gastroenterology. But yeah, most of us have been able to do it now. I don't know whether the process has become more easier or if the IMGs are more aware now, especially with people like you as well. And then and, and there are wonderful Facebook groups that, that share so much of knowledge and people are more aware of how, how things work now. So, so all in all, it's it's I, I don't know. It's becoming easier to get into specialties like cardiology and and radiology for IMGs. Uh, so uh, the, let's talk about the short listing first. How the short listing is done? It's 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 the same process as followed by the other specialities. So uh, as as most of the people know, there's a website, ST3 Recruitment website, where they tell us how they score us on the interviews. Uh, for uh, before the interviews, how they score us on the shortlisting, like they have scores on undergraduate qualifications, uh, which which uh, which somebody like for for us, which we which we can't do, so, so we can't gain on those points. Then there is postgraduate qualifications, uh, and some if somebody has done an MSc or a PhD or a, any other intercalated degree, they can take a score on that. But usually we don't. We IMGs don't score on these two these two. Uh, uh, main main things, and then there is there's a section for prizes and 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 scholarships that you have got. So uh, to, to to so if even if you have an undergraduate prize or a scholarship, you can show it in this section section. Or what I did, for example, is I presented a paper in a conference, and uh, luckily I got a prize for that. So I showed that prize. It was a national prize. So that gave me good 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 numbers there. And, and and in all of this, the most important thing is the MRC people, especially for doctors who are doing IMT training. If if you do not have a MRCP, you can't get into trainings like gastro and cardio. That's for sure because it's twelve marks. If if you don't score well in in this section, you won't you won't be uh, even even standing in the competition. So MRCP and the target date for the MRCP should not be the finishing of IMT or CMP. It should be the the application date because you need to have the MRCP by by the date when you apply, so that's that's a big thing as well, and and then we have presentations. Uh, it's 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 easy to score these eight marks because if you if you do what just one presentation, a national level presentation, you get eight marks, which is maximum, and it's quite easy to get it because you can if you have a case report or if you have a uh, a research publication. You can just uh, submit it to different uh, different conferences, and there are so many going on across. There's like, for example, I used to find out from you know the RCP website, um, uh, RCP London website, and and then I used to see the conferences, and I submit submitted a few few papers, and it's quite easy to get a paper accepted and presented anywhere in the country. Same same with uh, publications. So uh, I, I, I know a few candidates who spend so much of time thinking about publications and they think that it's something that it's very difficult to do. But to be honest, it's quite easy to get a publication. You just need to speak to the right people and find the right person to help you. You don't need to be the first author, even if you are a co-author of a couple of publications that should give you almost seven or eight marks. So that's where uh, we IMGs can easily score on. And then, uh, the, 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 thing, the thing that really helped me was the QIP because QIP has got 12 marks and what most of the IMGs do, they do one PDSA cycle and then they leave the QIP at that. But at the time of interviews, when you read the application, it clearly says that QIP can only count for your maximum marks if you have done two PDSA cycles and if you have presented it somewhere and basically when you have organized it, designed it and, and done two cycles and then uh, presented it somewhere. So that's when you get 12 marks for it. So that's that's something that's quite easy to do that all the British graduates would normally do and they have a, like three or four QIPs but we IMG some I don't know why we struggle with, with this uh, it's again try keeping keeping eyes and ears open on the ward and trying to find the right opportunities and grabbing them at the right time like if somebody is applying next day he should, he should be doing a QIP now so that he gets proper time to finish all the cycles of it and then present it same is with and the, and the last thing is teaching so teaching basically has two two aspects to it. So one is the training in teaching, and the other one is teaching experience. Uh, or training in teaching, uh, 
people do MSCs, people do uh, course uh, certificate courses, uh, but that takes time. If, if if you have time, you can go for it. But as as a trainee, you hardly get time to do such things. Uh, the, the the other options for it is like there are some one or two day courses in Oxford or some other places where you can go to and you can get one or two marks from there. And the other thing is the teaching experience. This is a separate thing. So teaching experience. Uh, it can be as small as, as doing a, a, a medical stu student teaching every week for, for three months. Or you can, like I used to do a twilight teaching for, for medical students. For I did it for three months in earlier this year. And I got a certificate out of there saying that I was involved in medical stu student teaching and stuff. So that, 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 that uh, gives, gives you points uh, in teaching experience. But uh, like some of my friends where they were RCP tutors, so they used to organize paces teaching in our hospital. They were just CT2s, but who had done paces very early on. And then they became RCP tutors. They got seven marks for that. So that's another thing. And then finally is the leadership. In leadership, uh, it, it's open. It can be medical, medical thing, non-medical thing, like BMAs or trainee representatives or whatever we can, we can, we can do. Although it's, it, I always found, it, found, found this bit hard to score on. But there are ways, like if if we if we spend some time on it on it and think about it, they, we can we can find out ways to score on this. So uh, I actually went through all the all the subsections of the application. So this is all this is all what all the trainees and whoever wants to apply to any specialty has to keep in the mind that they will be scored on these things. And when you apply to cardiology, it isn't necessary that you, your things would be in cardiology. It can be in anything else. Because most of my things were in. Uh, subjects like neurology. I had a few things in gastroenterology. Uh, so it does. It does. It isn't necessary that that you have like just the cardiology things. If you have like a QIP in cardiology, definitely that's going to add a. Uh, that's going to be beneficial to you. But this is this is how when you when you apply, this is how they score you, and the, the score is from uh, uh, eighty. I think eighty marks. Yeah. It, it, no, it's from sixty. Sixty marks. And, and then you get a shortlisting score. And for cardiology, the cutoff is usually 46, 40, that's, the, that's 47, that's the usual cutoff. So, and, and some deaneries score very high. For example, London deaneries, they would cut off at 50. Uh, Wessex, I think, cutoff was 48 something. Uh, similarly, it's different for different deaneries. So this is something that you have to keep in mind. And the number of training posts in different deaneries are different. For example, uh, South Yorkshire has six, 30, 30 jobs, I think, Wessex has, seven jobs london has about 50 uh, many many jobs so it's all in, on the website so even before applying you have to look at the numbers for example wales has four jobs if you apply to wales there will be like 50 candidates applying for those four jobs if you are not a good candidate it's difficult to get into this place and however like if some place has a fifth has 50 jobs so that means your opportunities are more so you have to be very clever in applying as well so that's that's pre-interview yeah. So you uh, explain very nicely that, you know, if you are thinking about cardiology or any other subspecialty of medicine, you need to start planning your journey quite, uh, quite in advance. You know, don't wait for the last uh, CD2 year. You know, you have to plan your MRCP at the point that by the time of application, you should have done it already. And you should have all of these things, which you mentioned, QIP, the quality improvement uh, activities, um, teaching and, and all this sort of thing that will give you marks. So it is advisable for core trainees or IMD trainees when they're starting to actually have a look at all those scoring systems and then start doing those things as they go on, rather than sort of waiting for the last year to suddenly think about uh, something and then be able, not be able to finish it at time. Exactly. And, and I'll just add one point here. Like most of the people that I have met, like it's, it, we can do all of these things together. You don't have to wait for a publication to happen and then do a QIP and then do an MRCP. You can do all of, like I did. I literally had like uh, 2000, CT one year. I, I, most of the things that I have, uh, either I've done it before before I came here or like the QIPs, the MRCP exam and everything else I did in CT one year. So you have enough time if you, if you uh, it's all about time management. If you, if you divide your time judiciously, everything can be done at the same time. You can do an exams together with the, with the QIP so that by the time of the interview, the application, you have got everything ready. So yeah. And how was your experience on the interview day? You know, because uh, that uh, again, interviews are variable between the subspecialties. So when you went for the cardiology interview, what was your experience like on that day? So, what was so the, the, inter 
the interviews the interviews were uh, were were quite straightforward it was it was a really a quick experience if everything finished in like 60 minutes so we know that we have to go with the portfolio and we have to spend some time building up that portfolio it should be it it it, it should clearly the port your portfolio should reflect the hard work that you have put on like making it I, i've seen some people going in like bags and and stuff not you have to make a proper portfolio with sections and dividers and then you show up there are three stations in in a cardiology interview station one is about uh your, your portfolio and about your commitment to specialty station two is clinical and station three is ethical and professionalism station two let's talk about station two first station two was a was a straightforward station it, it has got a it it has got a ma- major and a minor station so there are like a big case and a short case so they basically assess you on your clinical knowledge and they basically assess you on your communication skills out of all these th- in all these three stations the one thing that is really important is the communication skills with the with the with the with the uh, doctors or interviewing you and also they will test you and like they will sometimes as as they said to me that for example if i am a patient talk to me so they will test test your communication with the patient as well especially in the clinical station like for example one of the stations i was asked to act as if it was a flap to exam so the doctor became a patient and then i was asked to take history and do everything so uh, they can do this to you as well and then it's going to be general cardiology topics not not rocket science it's going to be basic uh, if, if somebody has gone through like basic cardiology stuff or has done rotation in cardiology he should be able to answer all the questions they they may ask you for a simple ecg to interpret like they did to me or uh, a, a simple diagnosis and they'll ask they basically are trying to see what line of management you take and whether you are a safe doctor it, it's just the same thing as as we have learned in lab and other other things as well and doing that abcd approach rather than you know going for big things first start from basic and then build on that so clinical station should be straightforward and it needs some preparation and then the ethical station and professionalism which is station 3 it again tests you on your communication and they will ask you some tricky questions but uh, that ic medical book it i think it really helps if you if you have read it once uh, so some of the tricky questions like a consultant shows up drunk what would you do and things like that they'll ask you the basic questions but if you have gone through the book you are able to mention a few terms like duty of candor or like stuff like that 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 makes them feel that you know a lot about ethics and professionalism so that should be straightforward as well so this is this is common in other specialties as well and then the station one is where the actual thing happens because in station one they will go through all your portfolio before you show up and they they will identify the areas that that they that are that they want to ask you questions from so in this station basically they it, it's two things they want to look, they want to see whether you are trainable whether they whether you have the qualities of going into higher specialty training number one and then the second part is uh, whether you are interested in cardiology what your commitment to cardiology is so basically commitment to cardiology is a small part of the whole interview process as well if you get your station 2 and 3 right and get the first part of station 1 right you can still make in, in, in into cardiology without having like big audits and big uh, you know research publications in cardiology so the first they will give you four, so when you enter station one they give 4 minutes to talk about why you want to do cardiology and explain to them what your commitments are so those 4 minutes are yours you can tell anything for example what i did in those 4 minutes rather than because i'll be very honest with you i did not have a lot of things in cardiology they were just few things here and there and very scattered things so in those 4 minutes my basic idea was to tell them that uh, uh focus on, on the fact that uh, i i'm in training and i've i've, I've, I've had printed all the all the things on my portfolio like msfs and feedbacks from my colleagues and teachings that i had done and medical student feedbacks and i focused basically on that saying that uh, i feel that i am i'm the right candidate for this job because i'm already in training and this is what you're looking for and i've already done this quite nicely i've got good feedback so that's what i focused on and then slightly i focused on like cardio aspects of cardiology as well like i've done a few ecg teachings the i've attended these clinics because that that was basically what i had like i attended a lot of cardiology clinics and i that's what i shared from my own experiences and then they asked me why you want to do cardiology and that's where the commitment to speciality part begins and then they, they they will see whether you know whether how much you know about the special the current progresses in the special like they ask me what is the role of artificial intelligence in cardiology 
and and what is the role like do you think gim and cardiology should be together so they they'll ask you general questions then just to assess and go go your uh, like go your knowledge about how much do you know about about the specialty and whether you're or whether you're just there just for the sake of it or are you actually interested in speciality so so it, it, it the station one is also uh, like it should if, if you look at it from from the perspective of like they, they will ask you questions about higher specialty training and then they will ask you questions particularly about cardiology if you divide it into like this uh, it should be a straightforward one as well and what what for me it was it was a, a basically spoke from my experience rather than from from my achievements so i told literally they said why did you want how did you choose cardiology i said i went to a cardiology clinic i met this this consultant and he was he was a device specialist and that's where my interest started i read about devices and went back again to his clinic did his clinic once and you know discussed with him that's where my interest came from I, and I, all of them were listening to me like quite they they they, they were, they were I could see in their eyes that they are they are interested in what I'm saying because I don't know what other people say in the interviews, but I was like speaking from my experiences, and they said what you want to do in future. I said I want to do interventions and and stuff like that. So if you speak from your experiences, you sh it should be fine. But if you have things in your portfolio, like if you have done some teachings, like ECG teachings, done some echo echo courses, or basically uh, written some reflections after doing cardiology clinics or uh, getting a letter for e email or a letter from your one of your consultant cardiologists saying that you are good at it and and you you are quite keen to do cardiology that that should that should be enough that should be enough and if you are done a qip in cardiology that should uh, that should seal the deal so yeah so thank you for sharing your experience um, uh, for the cardiology interview uh, so if somebody is currently uh, i'm just a general advice somebody img is currently working on a non training post or an imt post you know thinking about if various specialties what would be your advice to them you know how can they maximize their time and what can they sort of do to make sure that they can get their future uh, st training whichever especially they're thinking about so there are two kind of people who apply to specialty those who are in training and those who are in non training i'll speak for people who are in training because uh, this route uh, i'm familiar with this route so if you are in training you are you are at, a, at at an advantage even with this like round 1 and round 2 system gone now with, with the rlmt restrictions gone now i think even even then when you are in training you are at, at an advantage because first of all you will get to rotate in different specialties and your experiences are definitely considered valuable than someone who has just worked in one specialty for 2 years or 3 years so in training what you need to do is is get your exams out of the way as soon as you can so once you are done with your exams and that's when you start thinking about st3 then with the imt it's it's a blessing because they will have 3 years to just to 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 plan their application and they have first two years to get mrcp out of the way so i would suggest get your exams out of the way as soon as possible do a qip do proper two cycles organize it and present it somewhere get in touch with the right people i think that's the that's the main thing if you if you if you constantly speak to people who have already done things that you want to do then definitely you get more suggestions and they will give your input and even at the time of interviews and applications you have to ask somebody to go through your application and then do some interview practice as well uh it's it's at the end of the day what how i feel is is it's at the end of the day, it's, it's mostly tick box tick box thing so if you if you tick most of the boxes it it, it shouldn't be difficult yeah, most of the people make it like a big thing like getting into radiology for example is it's nothing if you do a few taster sessions if you if you tick the right boxes it it shouldn't be difficult and then having the right approach towards it like believing in like like you can get it is is also important rather than uh, i i know some people who didn't apply to specialties like cardio and gastro because they thought they wouldn't get it so yeah having the right kind of approach and planning your time especially on the ward itself as well for example if you if your job starts at 9 go at 8 and do some like put an extra half an hour one hour doing a qip or uh, you know doing some research work and even in the evening stay late for half an hour do some extra bit in in the lunch time go to the mess uh, talk to different people or doing different things get some ideas and use use this time basically you don't use need to like i never worked on weekends towards my applications my weekends are always like for fun but when you are on the job try to try to talk to as many people go to clinics talk to consultants and see what they suggest and that's what all what reflects in the interview as well 
once you have done all of this, that's what you speak about as well. And that's what they see. Yeah, I think you, you touched on a very important uh, topic that a lot of people, if you if you already thought that cardiology is impossible for you, then you will actually never go for it, you know, and, and, and this is unfortunate. There are a lot of IMGs, they start with an impression that certain subspecialties or certain specialists are actually out of their reach. So if you have already thought, if you've already got this in your head that this is out of my reach, then you will never try for it. And then, then, then you will never get it. And that will just reinforce your belief that it was never for you. You could never got it. But I think, as you mentioned, if you are, if you are doing your homework properly, and if you're putting in your hard work and you, if you are sort of uh, 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 doing all the things that you require for the shortlisting, all that, you know, you can take one step at a time, but you, you will get there at the end, you know, if you, if you got, got all those things done. And it's also awareness, like how, how things work. Uh, for example, one of my colleagues, he was, he's, he's quite a bright, bright, he was quite a bright CMT. He's a wonderful doctor. But unfortunately, he didn't know how the scoring system works. So he, he wasn't even shortlisted for interviews while he's, he's a better doctor than all of us. So th things like these, if you're aware and if you know how the system works, then you can do the proper things at the right time. So a lot of us know that we have to do MRCP exam and CMP, but most of the people don't have bases by the time of interview, like by the time of application. So if this thing is, if we start, like when somebody starts in, as an INP, he keeps this thing in mind, I have to get my paces out of the way in first two years, and then I have to do, like make a list of things. Then it shouldn't be, it should be easy. It should be easy. And it is just like planning it and uh, using the time properly, judiciously, especially on, on work and meeting the right people. Thank you for very much for sharing your experience. I'm sure a lot of people will find this very beneficial and uh, uh, hopefully they will, you, you can inspire people to take cardiology as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Nan. I, I really appreciate all the efforts that you are putting in, in, in making this video series. Like, as I said in the beginning, it, it's people like, like me have really benefited from people like you and who are like, like a lot of Facebook groups as well who are, who are quite informative and, and then thank you so much again. Thank you. Thank you.